with us? You made a good choice. You are in the house of the Lord. You haven't missed a day all year. Congratulations. We are here to worship our God, our firm foundation, the only King. Let's sing together. Our God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore,
prayer. We prayed in desperation. The songs of faith we sang through doubt and of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain and on that day we join the resurrection and we stand beside the heroes of the Wish him a happy new year. <laughs> well, yes, welcome and good morning. You may be seated for a couple of moments. Welcome especially to those of you who may be, this may be your first Sunday here at Calvary, or possibly you've been attending for a couple of weeks now. We want to welcome you and welcome all of you who are joining us here in person or online. If you are here, though, and it is your first time or you have not connected with us yet, we would highly encourage you to take that card that's in the pocket in front of you and fill that out, and you can hand it to one of the people at the Connect tables in the lobby. They would love to meet you, connect you with resources and people, answer questions. We also have a small gift for you if it is your first time visiting with us today. And for those of you who have been around for a while, we do want to simply thank you for your generosity throughout this year in your tithes and your offerings. It has been an amazing blessing to witness that generosity and to then turn around for me personally as a youth pastor, turn around and bless the youth of this church with programs, events, resources. It has really been an amazing year. And of course, we want to remind you to continue in that faithfulness as we head into this new year. A couple of reminders. Next week on January 8th, we are 
calling this our Vision Sunday. On Sunday morning during our service, Pastor Steve will introduce the mission and the vision that the deacons have formulated this year. And then that evening, we will all come back here at 5 o'clock for a, what we're calling a business meeting. We're going to present the budget. You'll get to see the details of the budget and then hear a report from all of the different pastors about what we've been able to accomplish this year in our ministries. So that'll just be a short meeting, no more than an hour that you, that we would love to have you attend. And so you can be informed about what's going on here at Calvary behind the scenes. And then that same week, we are starting up all of our Wednesday night activities once again on January 11th. So of course, Awana and youth group, which we're very excited about. But then also our adult classes that we're offering to all of you, and we would highly encourage you to get involved. And speaking of those classes, we have a short video to promote one of the bigger classes this week, uh, this semester. So if you would, please turn your attention to the screen. My name is Ross Pacini. In addition to being a board certified cardiologist, I also have degrees in microbiology and biochemistry. As many of you probably did, I was taught my entire life that evolution is a fact, that the Earth is billions of years old and the universe is even older. Obviously, this stands in contradistinction to what we all know God clearly stated in Genesis, that he created the Earth in six days. Well, how do we reconcile these two differences? We all know what the science tells us. We all know that if we don't accept the science, we're merely mocked and laughed at and told that we're just crazy religious people and whatnot. Well, that's always bothered me. And as a scientist, I want to address this for all of you. I want everyone to feel comfortable with the idea that God's word is the inerrant word. God invented science, and if we look at legitimate science and look to God's Word, we can find that God gave us the truth in the Bible. Over the next several weeks, I want to take you all on the journey that I went through, on the discovery of the problems with evolution, and I want to equip you with the ability to defend your faith. We do not need to accept millions and billions of years. We do not need to make compromises in our beliefs. So please come join me starting January 11th, starting at 645. These will be weekly sessions on Wednesday night, and I really hope to see you there. Well, amen. If you want to be a part of putting Darwinism to the grave once and for all, please come and join us in that class. And if there's something else you may be interested, we have lots of other offerings on Wednesday nights as well. Basic theology courses, men's and women's courses, Bible studies, all sorts of different things that you can get involved in. So we would encourage you to do that. Well, it is a new year and a new month, so we have a new memory verse. So if you would, please recite this with me, the reference and then the verse and the reference again. Daniel 7, 18. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, for all ages to come. Daniel 7, 18. Very good. Now, if you would, please continue with me in our worship as we offer our prayers and our praises to our great God. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for today. We thank you for this new year that you have blessed us with. And we pray that as we bring these requests and these praises to you, that we would do so with humble hearts and yet confident in your intercession for us. And so we do lift up those members of our church and their family members. We pray for Jay and all his health issues and dealing with the side effects of his meds. We lift up Karen's mom, Eva, who fell and is in a lot of pain. Give Dave and Karen wisdom in what is best for Eva's care. We lift up Karen as she deals with losing her cat due to age. We lift up Kim Gardner, who has been diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. We lift up Drew's marriage. We thank you, Lord, for bringing Enoch home safely from his trip to Africa. We pray for healing for Denise Winton and the health issues she is dealing with. We lift up Sean Phillips and his recovery from surgery. We pray for Joanne Fossler and her family situation. We pray for Mary, her children, and Patsy Turner and their financial situation. Lord, please please provide for them and watch over them. We lift up Melody as she struggles for healing and strength for her. We continue to pray for movement in Ken's hands. We lift up Alaska, Everest, Sam, and Sydney and ask for healing. 
We lift up George's heart valve and continued healing. And Heavenly Father, we pray for all of those who do not know you as Savior. We ask for a moving in their hearts and that they would put their faith in you, Lord. We pray for our family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors. We lift up Blake, Bryce, Bailey, Ken, and Cindy. And Lord, may they come to know you this year. And Lord, we do lift up our prayers for Colby and Fitcher and Whitley at the loss of um, their dad, Colby's dad. And I just pray that you would be with the family and that you would comfort them and bring them peace. And Lord, we thank you for the salvation of their father and our confidence that we have in you and eternal life. And Lord, we do thank you for this year that you've given us, the blessings and the mercies. Lord, thank you for your provision, your grace. We pray for this new year and ask that we would surrender to you and your will for us as individuals and as a church. And Lord, we do look forward to what you will do in this new year. Lord, as always, we pray that in everything we do here in this service and our worship before you, with our families, our church family, that everything we would do would glorify and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us, will you? Let's continue in our worship. I'm thankful for God's mercy.
that we can hold on to right now. God, you are good, and we are thankful for the security we have in you. You can sing it all, or you can just sing the answer. Sing whatever you want to sing. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deep? dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made new we do is all creation groaning it is is a new The glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone holy? we are here to declare that you are the one who is worthy. You are the one who is worthy of our worship. And we are so very thankful that you include us in your great and sovereign plan. 
God, as we stand here on January 1st, 2023, and we look forward, we know that you hold our future in your hands. You know what's coming in 23. You know far beyond. And God, you are sovereign. And we praise you for that. We thank you for making a way for us to live with you in fellowship and one day in heaven forever. Thank you for that privilege. Thanks for paying the price. Thanks for being that perfect sacrifice, that perfect king. We are so thankful for you. And now as Pastor Steve comes to open your book, God, I pray that your spirit would have its way in this place. Have your way, spirit. Move in us and through us. Change us by the power of your word, by the power of your spirit. Change us. Please make us more like your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you would, open your Bibles this morning to Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. Now, if you forgot your Bible, or maybe you don't have one, then reach for the one in the seat in front of you. Turn to page 45 in the New Testament. Last weekend during our Christmas celebration, we talked about how God used humble parents, a humble place, and a humble profession to bring His Son to the earth. The humble parents were Mary and Joseph. The humble place was the little town of Bethlehem, and the humble profession was the shepherds. Now today, as we continue Luke's account of the birth of Christ, the theme of humility continues, and the passage briefly focuses on Mary and Joseph, but then it turns to two other humble individuals, and three words describe them. If you would, write down this first word, and that is priorities. As we will discover, reading these verses, Mary and Joseph, as the earthly parents of Jesus, and when eight days had passed before his circumcision, for a Jewish baby boy, the eighth day was a very important day in their life. There was a sacred tradition they had observed for nearly 1,800 years, and that was the tradition of circumcision. Back in Genesis, God instructed Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And then God looked at Abraham, who was very old, and said, And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised, here it is again, throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house or who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants... A servant who is born in your house or who is bought with money shall surely be circumcised. This shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person is off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So for a Jew, circumcision was serious business. It was the physical sign, the token of, of God's eternal covenant. Well, Jesus was a descendant of Abraham, and that meant that he too had to observe this tradition. Now, normally, I wouldn't have to say this, but the fact that Christ was circumcised means that he was a male, and that means that he had male parts. He had a masculine anatomy, okay? Now, never before in my ministry would I ever think I'd have to clarify that, But uh, recently, a bishop in the Anglican Church in England got up and put forth an utterly blasphemous treatise in which he tried to describe Christ in other terms. But Christ was a male. He was circumcised. Now, why wait until the eighth day? I mean, today, if you've had a son, you go to the hospital, they usually ask you, would you like for your son to be circumcised? And there are good health reasons for doing it. Then they'll do it usually right before they go home. But why wait until the eighth day? Well, they waited until the eighth day because on that day, vitamin K levels are at their peak. And this causes the blood to clot better. That's why they waited until the eighth day. 
So the time came for Jesus to be circumcised. Let's read on. And his name was then called, here's the greatest name ever uttered by tongue or by pen, Jesus. It means Yahweh saves. In Hebrew, it's pronounced Yeshua. The Old Testament equivalent was Joshua. The reason we don't call Jesus Joshua in the New Testament is because the New Testament was written in Greek. Greek has no SH sound. So the gospel writers replaced the SH sound with an S. They added another S to the end so it would make the name masculine. But Joshua was a type of Jesus because he was known for being a savior. Joshua led Israel's armies into Canaan. And they defeated the Canaanites, and he delivered the promised land to the descendants of Abraham. Well, Yeshua, or Jesus, would come to be known as the Savior because he would defeat the devil and deliver redemption for all who would believe. Look back at verse 21. His name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Mary and Joseph had no part in naming him. His name was chosen by his heavenly father long before he was miraculously conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit. His name, Yeshua, or Jesus, reflected his mission and purpose on earth. So two things happened when he became eight days old. He was circumcised, and then his name was made known publicly to his family and friends. Look at verse 22. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, so now 33 days after Jesus was born, there were some things that Mary and Joseph had to take care of to satisfy the law of Moses. Now, as we go through these, remember we're talking about having the right priorities. And from the outset, Mary and Joseph had the right priorities. Pleasing God was at the top of their list. So here's what they had to do. Look back at verse 22. They brought him up to Jerusalem, the holy city, to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves. If you've been listening to Christmas music like I have since the middle of November... Remember the 12 days of Christmas? Two turtle doves and a partridge and a pear tree. Where do you think the two turtle doves came from? Let's find its origins in Scripture. Two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, this purification process involved three things. First, Mary had to offer a sacrifice to purify herself from the birthing process, which the law of Moses had said rendered her ceremonially unclean. The prescribed offering was a lamb, but if the couple was poor, God would allow them to substitute two turtle doves or two young pigeons. So now we know that Joseph and Mary were very poor because they offered the substitute sacrifice. The second thing they had to do was to redeem Jesus from the temple since he was the firstborn, and that involved paying a temple fee of five shekels. And then thirdly, they had to dedicate him to the Lord. Now, Why did they do all of these things? They did all of these things because they had the right priorities. Their relationship with God was the most significant thing in their life. Now, what does that look for us? What does that look like for us today? I mean, obviously, uh, we don't go to the church and pay to redeem our children. We don't have to offer an animal sacrifice. We do dedicate our children to the Lord when they're born. But what are the right priorities, spiritually speaking? Well, a priority is something that you give special attention to. It's something so important that you're willing to invest time and resources into it to make it happen. I know that many of you like to run. The week of Christmas, you'll remember, was very cold. Wind chill was 38 below. Well, Pastor Shane came in and introduced his running partner to me. You see, running was such a high priority to them that not even negative wind chill would stop them. It's important. Last week, 
Went to bed on Monday night, and as sometimes happens, I didn't sleep very well. Got about three and a half hours of sleep. But the next morning, I was up in the gym working out with my partner. You know why? Because we have a meet coming up, and I had to train. And I had a very lousy training session. I don't mind telling you. But I did it anyway because it's a priority. But why do we do these things? We do these things because they're so important to us, we're willing to sacrifice to make them happen. So on this New Year's Day 2023, let me ask you a question. How high on your list of priorities is your relationship with God? Let me follow that up with another question. How radically different would your life look if over the next 365 days you made your relationship with God your highest pursuit? Are you stuck in a rut? Do you find yourself plagued by the same sins, falling victim? to same evil habits over and over again. Well, let me tell you how you can break those habits, and that is by substituting those habits with good, godly habits. The habits of a disciple. Write down these suggestions. Here's the first one. Attend church every week. Don't miss unless you're providentially hindered. Don't let yourself be satisfied with being a convenient church attender, but rather be committed. And the same holds true for your family. Now, let me step on some toes here. Your kids should not be the ones to decide whether or not they attend church. I was youth pastor here for 19 years, 19 blessed, glorious years. But I can tell you, I saw parents make a lot of mistakes. When their kids get in middle school, the kids start deciding, well, maybe I don't want to go to church. And parents think, well, you know, it kind of needs to be up to them to decide, you know, what's right for them. And You know, we don't let them do that in any other area of their life. Why would we do it in church? If your kids live under your roof, if they eat your food, if they enjoy (coughs) your heating and air conditioning, then you have the right to make that decision for them. Now, I promise you that we will try to make church so exciting for them that they want to be here. But in the end, parents, you have to take charge of their spiritual development. And that means that when the family of God gathers, you're here with your family. So be in church every week. Here's another idea. Read the Bible every day and journal. Now, when I was in middle school, our church went to a camp up in Dayton, Tennessee, Fort Bluff Camp in the Smoky Mountains. Beautiful, beautiful camp. Not unlike the one that we take our kids to every summer, Maranatha Camp. By the way, that should be a priority, too. If you have a middle schooler or a high school teen, they should be in camp. But I'll never forget that week we had a black belt karate demonstrator as the featured speaker and all throughout the week he kept doing various exhibitions which I remember he failed at most of them and he would try to get volunteers from the audience well by the end of the week we had caught on that this guy wasn't quite in his prime anymore and it may not be in your best interest to go up there but he screamed and yelled and hollered and told us we were all sissies and You know, when the communists invaded, we were going to lay down and die, and we were worthless and all that other. So by the end of the week, we were were pretty beat up. On a Friday afternoon, the camp director brought in a pastor who was in his 80s. His name was Dr. Lee Robertson. He built the great Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. By the way, Pastor Cleve and Kim went to the college associated with that church. Great men and women of God through the years. When I was in middle school, they brought Dr. Lee Robertson in, and and he wasn't interested in being cool or being hip. He wore a double-breasted suit to speak to a group of about 700 teenagers. And it was a hot afternoon, a hot July afternoon, last day of camp. And I'll never forget that aged man of God stood up there, and he challenged us to read the Bible. And he told us how to do it. He said, if you'll read four chapters a day from the Bible, then you can read through the entire Bible in a year. And then he went on to say, if you do that, I promise God will use you in a great way if you do it your whole life. He said, what you do with your Bible determines what God can do with you. And I have never forgotten those words. Outside of being saved and marrying my wife, that was the single most transformational moment in my entire life. I remember as a middle school kid sitting there with all the insecurities that I had, 
trying to fit in, trying to find direction in life and my way in the world. And here was a man who looked like Moses telling me the secret to life. And I followed his advice. And I've been following his advice for 39 years. Been reading the Bible through. Now you can do this in a couple of ways and I want to challenge you to do this today. You can start in Genesis and read straight through four chapters every day. If you don't miss a day, then you'll finish up early sometime in October or you can add some variety to it. You can read three chapters from the Old Testament, one from the New. You can follow a chronological plan where you follow the Bible based on its historical timeline. But let me give you a word of caution. There are some parts of the Bible that are difficult to get through. If you start reading the Bible straight through, you're going to love the book of Genesis. You're going to love the book of Exodus when Pharaoh drowns in the Red Sea. But then you're going to get to the latter part of Exodus and then uh, to the book of Leviticus. How many of you love the book of Leviticus? How many of you have read the book of Leviticus? But it's inspired by God. It's in, it's in the Word of God for a reason. And so just like when you go to the gym and there are a lot of exercises that are difficult, but if you do them, you reap the benefits. The same is true when reading your Bible. You have to make yourself do what your sinful nature doesn't want to do. And I would encourage you this year, 2023, to read the Bible in its entirety and then go a step further. Journal. Take a 99-cent composition book. Leave the first page blank. I'll come back to that later and tell you why. But beginning at the top of the second page, you write the date and the passages you read. So if you start today, you write January 1, 2023, and then below it, you write Genesis 1 through 4. And after you've read, you pick out one passage from those four chapters that you read and write down your thoughts about it. If you don't understand it, that's okay. I've read the Bible through 39 times, and I tell you, I still don't understand all of it. Never will. The Bible is an endless treasure trove of truth that is beyond the human mind. So if there's a passage of Scripture that stumps you, then just pick one of those verses out and write that verse down verbatim in your journal. Now here's a third suggestion. Not only go to church every week, read your Bible and journal every day. Here's another habit of a disciple. Pray every day. Going back to that first page of your composition book, right at the top prayer list. What you're going to do now is write down the things that you're going to pray for every single day. Here are the first two entries. The first one is praise. You take some time and thank God for who he is. That is, you thank him for his attributes, and then you thank him for what he's done. The second thing you pray for is forgiveness. You ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you any sin that you may have committed. And you confess it right then and there. And then after that, write down the names of your family, your friends, your co-workers. Do you have somebody at work that really gets under your skin? Pray for them. You will find that you cannot remain anger, angry and bitter at somebody if you pray for them every day. That's why Jesus tells us to pray for our enemies. He doesn't want us to go through life with a bitter, angry heart. Pray for your enemies. Pray for your elected officials. Pray for the president, whether you voted for him or not. Pray for Congress, whether they're spending money they have or not. You pray for them. And then after that, any needs you might have, write them down and take them to God in prayer. I assure you, this habit of reading your Bible and praying will drastically change your life. Husbands, it will make you a better husband. Wives, it will make you a better wife. Sons and daughters, it will make you a better son or daughter. It will make you a better person if you spend time in the presence of God. But let me warn you, the devil will fight nothing in your life than the sacred time that you spend with God. Every day, he will throw a challenge in your way to take you away from your time with God. But you've got to make it a priority. Now let's move on to the second word in your outline, and that is the word patience. Look at verse 25. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous. Now earlier in chapter 1, that was the same word that Luke used to describe the parents of John the Baptist, Zacharias and Elizabeth. 
Remember, biblical righteousness is not volitional, but it's positional. Being righteous doesn't come from just doing the right things. Being righteous comes from being positionally right with God. And once you've repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus, you then receive as a gift the perfect righteousness of Jesus. That's what Luke meant when he described Simeon as being righteous. Here's another adjective, and devout. This is the Greek word eulabase. It means reverent. Simeon revered God. He feared him. He loved him. He did what was necessary to please him. And you can never be devout. You can never be a devoted follower of Jesus until you have first been made righteous. Because once you receive that imparted righteousness of Christ, you think differently. You act differently. Your desire is to please God, not yourself. Now let's continue reading and discover more things about this righteous, devout man. Look at the next phrase. He was looking or waiting for the consolation of Israel. What's the consolation of Israel? The era of the Messiah. He was waiting for Messiah to come and bring salvation to the world. Look at the next part of that verse. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. God's presence was with this righteous, devout man. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. You see, at some point in his walk with God, the Holy Spirit spoke to him as he was praying and patiently waiting for the coming of the Messiah that he would not die until he saw him with his own eyes. Verse 27, and he came in the Spirit into the temple. You see, he was walking so closely with God that he was sensitive to his voice. One day the Spirit of God looked at old Simeon and he said, it's time to go to church. Get up. I got something I want you to see. And guess who he runs into? And when the parents, that's Mary and Joseph, brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms. Remember the Holy Spirit said, Simeon, don't worry, you're not going to die until you see the Messiah with your own eyes. And that day, not only did he see him, he got to touch him. He cradled the consolation of Israel in his arms. <coughs> and he blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. You see, he was ready to leave this world. God had kept his word, the Messiah had arrived. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples. And that's what he says about the baby that he held in his arms. A light of revelation to the Gentiles. He was a Jew. The Gentile world, however, would no longer be on the outside looking in. No longer would they walk in darkness. The Messiah was born, yes, as a Jew, but he was born for all people. He would bring the truth of God to all the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Now, what does that mean? Simeon prophesied that one day this baby would sit on the throne of David as its rightful king. The monarchy, which had been gone since 586 B.C., would now be restored. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. Now, beginning in verse 34, he's going to issue several prophetic statements about Jesus. Let's look at them. And Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. He looked at Mary and Joseph and said, Those who believe in your son will rise. Those who reject him will fall. Jesus was a polarizing figure in Israel. He was the dividing line between truth and untruth, between belief and unbelief, between eternal life and eternal death. And by the way, he's still that way today. 
I saw a quote the other day by Vody Bauckham that said, the problem with this generation is that they are in love with a Jesus they don't really know. We all love the baby in the manger. But if you read the rest of the story, the baby don't stay in a manger. The baby comes back as king of kings and lord of lords, and he sits on the throne. The baby in his earthly ministry said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the life and ministry of Jesus is a question that we all have to come to terms with. Do we accept him for who he claimed to be, the son of God? Look at the next part. And for a sign to be opposed, long before he would be the glory of Israel or their rightful king, he would be rejected. The nation of Israel would experience his ministry firsthand. Tens of thousands would sit on the hillside and hear him teach. Thousands would be eyewitness to his many miracles, including raising Lazarus from the dead after he had been dead four days. But in spite of all of this, they would still reject him as king. So keep that in mind next time you experience rejection. Are you dealing with rejection this morning? It comes in many ways. Remember, Christ was rejected too. He knows how you feel. He goes on, and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. He's talking specifically now to Mary. He says, Mary, you are going to see it all. This is going to hurt. A sword will pierce through your own soul when you see all that your son will endure. The false accusations, the misrepresentations, the betrayal, and ultimately the crucifixion. Put yourself in Mary's sandals for a moment. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the mother of Christ to watch him be crucified? That's what Simeon was telling her. This Christ child is bringing you much joy now, but a sword is going to pierce through your soul because before he wears the crown, he must first bear the cross. He must patiently endure the hardships of rejection before he reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, I think most of you would agree with me that patience is the most difficult virtue to develop. Amen? We want things to be right and we want them right now but we have to come to grips with the fact that God works on a different timetable God is never rushed God doesn't get in a hurry he's eternally patient many of you know that I'm a huge fight fan I love the sport of boxing I think boxing is brutal barbaric and I really think it should be outlawed but until it's outlawed I'm going to watch it I enjoy it. There's nothing more beautiful than watching two skilled fighters, you know, technically probe each other's defenses and then beat each other's brains out. It's just beautiful. This past week, I spent my le- leisure time in the evening going back and watching some old fights from the late 70s, 80s, and 90s. And this man right here on the screen is the greatest example of patience in the world of sports. Do you recognize him? That's big George Foreman. Before there was the George Foreman grill, there was George Foreman the fighter. He made a whole lot more money selling that grill than he ever did fighting. But back in 1973, he knocked Smokin' Joe Frazier down six times in two rounds before they mercifully stopped the fight before he killed him. And that night in Kingston, Jamaica, George Foreman won the heavyweight title. Well, his reign would be short. A year later, he went to Zaire. And he fought Muhammad Ali, who knocked him out in the eighth round. Well, his invincibility now shattered. Foreman fell into a deep depression until one day he found Jesus Christ as his Savior. The transformation was instantaneous. Big George became a pastor. He built a church in Houston. He began traveling the globe, telling everybody about how Jesus changed his life. Well, he took his earnings from boxing and he started a youth center in Houston to help out with the teens of the area who were getting in trouble. Well, his accountant met with him one day and said, George, you're out of money. We're going to have to close the center. This was unthinkable to George, so he knew what he had to do. He got himself back in shape, and even though he was over 40, he began the most unlikely of comebacks. 
When he got back in the ring at the age of 40, he discovered that he was different. He was not filled with anger and rage as before. Jesus had changed him. He was now a better fighter because he was a patient fighter. And he won. 25 straight times until he earned a title shot against then champion Evander Holyfield. If you go back and watch that fight, Foreman didn't win that fight, but about midway through the fight, Holyfield hit him with about 20 straight power shots. He unloaded on Big George everything he had and could not put him away. Well, George lost the fight, but he secured enough respect and more importantly, enough money to live comfortably for the rest of his life as well as keep his beloved youth center open. But still, there was some unfinished business in his soul. He was still haunted from that loss to Ali. So he kept fighting. Finally, one week shy of the 20th anniversary of his loss to Muhammad Ali, he went to his locker and he put on the very same trunks that he had worn the night Ali had knocked him out. And he climbed through the ropes to challenge 26-year-old reigning heavyweight champion Michael Mora, a terror of a fighter from Detroit who was 35-0 and with 27 knockouts. And they made fun of him all night long. They called him the clown prince of boxing. He was now 45 years old. And for 10 rounds, Big George took everything Mora could throw at him. Finally, in the 10th round, nobody was laughing anymore. Moore came in close, and Foreman unloaded that big right hand and dropped him like a sack of flour, and he didn't get up. And the crowd roared its approval. And Big George walked over to his corner, wearing the same trunks that he had worn 20 years earlier when he had lost, and he dropped to his knees, and he looked to heaven, and he thanked God for giving him the strength to make it right after 20 years. He was champion again but he had to be patient. Now, is your faith in God strong enough to trust his timing? Are there failures in your past that still haunt you? Are there unreconciled things with others that even though you've tried to make right, seemingly to no avail? Trust God in his timing. God will make them right, but you have to trust him. That's patience. Now write down this last word, and that's passion. Look at verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years. That's a nice way of saying she was old. And had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. So seven years after marriage, her husband died, and then she never remarried. What did she do with her time? She never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. You see, with the love of her life gone, she just fell in love with God. Her passion became serving God. She happens to be there at the temple because she never left. She happens to be there when Mary and Joseph bring Jesus. Look at verse 38. At that very moment... While Simeon was holding Jesus, uttering his prophetic blessing, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When she saw Jesus, she got so excited that she went and told others about him, and she never stopped. And if we truly love Jesus, we will do the same. You know, next week I'm going to be sharing with you our strategic vision and mission we'll be sharing with you plans for the new year but beginning in november i really began asking god god what do you want calvary community church to do what kind of church do you want us to be and god put in my soul a burning passion to see lincoln reached for jesus christ would you not agree that our city is in worse shape than it's ever been spiritually I feel it in my soul. There's a darkness here in our city. But yet 50 years ago this June, God led some great people to plant a church on the hill so that we could be a lighthouse. And I want God to use our church this year 
to a greater extent than we've ever been used before. I want to see more people get saved this year. I want to see more people get baptized. There are confused, hurting people all over our city who need the gospel. Just before Christmas, my wife and I were in a convenience store and a a young man came in and was just being, oh, he was being terribly, terribly vulgar. And it, it disturbed not only myself, but also a lot of the other people who were shopping there. And I remember getting back in the car and looking at my wife and I was saying, boy, that guy's really got problems. And then I looked in the mirror and God said, yeah, and so do you. In my heart, I, I judged this man. Would you happen to believe that this morning when I stopped at the same convenience store, guess who I ran into? Same guy. And I was able to have a conversation with him. And I got back in the car this morning because I was late, need to get to church to do a job. And I said, Lord, would you please allow me to run across his path again because he needs you. And right now, you all can think of somebody in your life who desperately needs the Lord. Remember, like you once were vulgar and foul in the eyes of God. So there are people who are still apart from God who need him. And we need to be like Anna. We need to get a glimpse of Jesus and look at people the way God looks at them and go after them so they can hear the gospel. And that's what I want God to use our church to do this year. So as we mark the beginning of the new year, take a look at your priorities. If God doesn't top the list, then you have some work to do. You have the wrong ones. Is there something in your past you're holding on to? Are you having trouble turning the page from yesterday to today and moving on? Do you have the patience to wait on God to make it right in his way and in his time? And is Jesus your all-consuming passion? If he is, you're going to share the good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask God that you would use us this year in a way that we've never been used before God may we be a lighthouse Lord may many people come to the knowledge of your salvation Lord because of our efforts this year collectively as your family Lord just as Luke wrote in the book of Acts that because of the ministry of one church every person in Asia Minor heard the gospel so God we pray that because of this church Every person in Lincoln, Nebraska would hear the gospel. And Lord, may your spirit go before us and turn their hearts to repentance and faith in you. God, may we see trophies of grace this year in our church. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you for worshiping with us today. Don't forget, coming up in just a week and a half, we start our next semester of our uh, Wednesday night classes and pay special attention to the creation class and the video. That is going to be a fantastic class, and there will be other classes as well. But make sure that come January 11th that you are here. We also start up a WANA that night and youth group. Now, next Sunday, as I mentioned, is Vision Sunday. I'll be going through our vision and mission statements on Sunday morning with you. It'll be an unusual Sunday. And then that evening, we want to invite you back for a church-wide business meeting, two things will happen. One, all of our pastors will give a report as to their ministries, as to what happened in 2022, as well as plans that we have for 2023. And then our deacons are going to present the budget to you. You can ask questions, and uh, you can see exactly how your money that you so graciously give to us will be spent. One more order of business before we go. That is, Bo Ballard, would you come up here? I have had the privilege... Of watching Bo grow up. Bo was in our youth group here at Calvary from the time he was in middle school until he graduated, went off to college. He's a graduate of Parkview Christian School. And as many of you know, this past couple of weeks, our governor, Pete Ricketts, has appointed him to serve in the legislature. Uh, <coughs> he will fill out the remainder of this term because our current legislator, uh, is now the Attorney General, Mike Hilders, and he's been a friend of this school and this ministry for a long time, but he will now be our Attorney General, and so the Governor tapped Bo to fill his place. And as proud as I am of Bo, I'm also fearful for him because he's venturing into the lion's den, and he's one of our own. Jim, would you stand up? I know Jim, his dad, is here. 
Jim is one of our deacons. He's not going to stay. He's going to raise his hand. Go ahead, Jim. Stand up. And his beautiful wife, Barb, Sister Eden, they've all been a part of our ministry for years, and I count them as dear friends. In fact, Bo's granddaddy, Jim Jeffers, we used to meet for lunch usually once a month at Ruby Tuesdays, and uh, we talked about Bo often, and we both knew that God had great things in store. So church, I'm going to ask you to pray for Bo as he goes to the legislature. He needs your prayers. He needs God's protection. And uh, when I first received the news that was happening, I said, well, Bo, remember now, Daniel stood before Nebuchadnezzar, and, and he was able to do great things for God. And I don't think there's anybody down there that's worse than Nebuchadnezzar. So I don't, maybe there is. But let's pray for Bo this morning. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the privilege that I've had to be a part of this young man's life. And God, we're so proud of him now. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be upon him. I pray, Lord, that legislation that he writes would advance your kingdom priorities. Lord, may we look out for the fatherless. Lord, may we look out for the widow. God, may we be a compassionate people. May we seek to advance legislation that glorifies you. Help us to stand for what's right. Help us to fight what is evil. And I just pray that you would protect Bo in a great way. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you, my brother. Thank you. All right. Church, it's been great worshiping with you today. We will see you next Sunday, and may God bless you.